Hello, everyone. The day is Thursday, May 28, 2020. This is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here. I'm excited to see more and more people are finding the show. So something's working, and that's a good thing. What do we talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, I have a lot to say about that. I have a lot to say in the slides, too. So we'll get to that in just one second. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep them relative to the slides so my ADD doesn't kick in. And when we open it up to the live charts, feel free to ask about anything you want. Also, hold off until we get the live charts for your favorite stock picks. And when we do get there, ask about one at a time to make sure I cover them all. So what are we talking about? Well, one thing I want to touch upon is that some of these angels have falling, fallen and some of these Phoenix stocks are beginning to rise. So the past leaders could be coming laggards, could be in a key word in that sentence. And I'll flesh that out in just one second. And some of the laggards could become the new leaders. I want to follow up on volatility. I tried not to fire up all my volatility screens this morning because I didn't want to get into that volatility trap, that rabbit hole. But I do want to follow up on what I've been saying over the last several weeks, and I think it's fairly important. Also, I have a live IPO trade I want to discuss with you, and I think it could be a, a pretty good lesson on a multitude of levels, or on multiple levels, I should say. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often summing up. All predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I borrowed that from my buddy, Greg Morris. We have bear market updates. I'm not sure. I woke up this morning thinking, uh, when do I take that down? Looks like kind of the all clear here, huh? Maybe so. We'll see. Certainly improving. And I think for now, and spoiler alert, we'll talk about this in a little while. I think for now, we need to play the hand that's dealt and stick with these momentum stocks for now, at least. And I'll flesh that out in a lot more details. So last couple of weeks, we've been talking about the flattening of the curve and volatility. And this is left over from last week. You can see the volatility curve has flattened out and has begun to drop off a little bit. And as I often say, indicators don't necessarily indicate anything. They illustrate what's already in the chart. And so it illustrates that we've been in a bit of a trading range, or quite the trading range, I should say. Now, one thing we talked about last week was that the 650 reading was getting fairly low. And we'll take a look at that reading when we get to the live charts. Usually that means a large move is imminent. Now, again, just real quick, as we discussed in this last couple of weeks, what does the flattening of the curve mean? Well, it means conditions have changed. Well, conditions are always changing. But I think that we've, we're kind of shifting out of this crazy bear market mode. And we went into this range bound mode and now we're coming out of the range and we're doing okay. And as I just said a minute ago, it illustrates, not indicates, but illustrates that we're in a range bound market. And the chance of a large move begins to increase as the volatility dries up. Now, are we seeing that to the upside so far? I think so. Volatility is hard to time off of. I could show you some wonderful times in the past where volatility has become extreme and the market just kind of, it just sort of pinpoints the exact low in the market and it's a beautiful thing. But the problem is a lot of times it, it doesn't. So you got to be really careful, but it's still useful nonetheless. And I think that's why I've been spending so much time lately on it. Now, sometimes you get a first move and that's a false one. That that's not always the case though. Sometimes your first move is a real move. And right now, and I hate to use the word hope, but I'm hoping the expansion is coming out of the range. It's a lot easier to make money on the long side than the short side. I was talking with some clients recently, and he said, Boy, well, one in particular, and he's like, Man, I knew when you went bearish, when you had like 20 shorts on the landry list and no longs, I knew that was it. And it's like, yeah. But we only ended up taking a couple of those, and I think they both halved in value, which is fantastic. But the problem is they all set up at once. They all go at once. And then, of course, the retrace rally suck and all those other things I talk about on the short side. So the long side, 
much easier to play. So last week we talked about the volatility drying up and we talked about how the six day reading was well below the 50 day reading. And again, a large move imminent. And this is what I was talking about. Sometimes you get a fake out and then sometimes you get the real breakout to the downside. Now that doesn't mean that will occur. This doesn't mean that we're at a fake out now, but if we come back into the range and take out the other side, it would be ugly. And I think it's good to have several scenarios in your head, not to confuse yourself, but okay, I'm a trend following moron, the market's going up, let's continue to follow the market up. But if things go sour, if things turn south, then maybe I have to come back to this scenario. Now, last week we talked about the volatility dropping off on a 50-day basis, and it wasn't quite as obvious last week as it is now. And the point I made last week is that if you look for the 45-day, because you're dropping off some of those February and March readings, then it was dropping off more sharply and much more sooner. And then the 40-day reading, obviously, because you're dropping off a lot of those big down days coming into this big slide has really begun to implode. So you're dropping off back here, you're adding on in here. And more of this, more of the sideways action, and now the upward move. As a general statement, upward move, you will get a lowering in volatility. And downward move, you will get a rising in volatility. So we're taking off a lot of these down moves in here, these extreme down moves, and then we're putting in some of the, or adding in some of these up moves and sideways moves. Now, the old adage, the old Wall Street adage, they slide faster than they glide. And of course, a pilot emails me and says, Dave, when you glide, it goes down. Well, just work with me. <laughs> they glide higher if there is such a thing. And that's one reason why the volatility drops off when you're in a bit of a gradual market move. Also, persistency, by the way, which is fantastic when you get it on the upside, will cause volatility to begin to drop off. So if a stock goes up day after day after day after day, the volatility, as a general statement, will begin to drop off. Now, as I said last week, take it to an extreme when you start looking at these really, really short-term volatility readings, like a three-day, and I've never plotted a three-day until last week or week before, and I started playing around with it in the five day, the six day. And again, it could be a bit of a rabbit hole, but it is kind of fun to play around with. And you can see these short term volatility readings just go to an absolute extreme up around 160 on the last bottom or so before they begin to top out. And it sort of lines up fairly well with the market bottom. Doesn't mean you want to try to catch that bottom, but if you do see volatility go to an absolute extreme, that's a good time to make sure you're trailing your stops lower on your shorts and also a good time to make sure you're taking those partial profits. In other words, lightening up on the short side and bracing for that inevitable retrace rally. So you can see the longer term moving averages are now, I'm sorry, the longer term historical volatility readings, the 40 and 45 and 50 day, are beginning to implode just like those shorter term readings, which imploded a while back. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting is the TFM 10% system could actually be a buy signal soon. So let's take a look at this. So this green line in here is the buy line, so to speak. And as I say each week, just in case somebody's new here, the, the buy line is simply 10% less than the 50 week closing high, okay? So this is the highest close in 50 weeks. So if you, the, sometimes I put the 50 week closing high in here, it would look like that. You take 10% from that. Notice you start making new highs in here, new highs, new highs, new highs this line begins to rise up. Now, one thing that I didn't think about when I designed this system, because you're looking at weekly bars and you go one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you're, you're doing a walk forward test. 
and you can go through 50 bars in less than a minute. Well, 50 bars or 52 bars is a week, right? I'm sorry, is a year on a weekly chart. So before you know it, you're like, oh, okay, we've got a sell signal, we've got a buy signal, and it seems like that happens pretty quick, but it might take a year and sometimes longer to happen. Now, one thing that I didn't realize with the system is that when you have a V-shaped recovery, the buy line takes a while to catch up. Now, I haven't played with it too much, but I like to throw out things as fodder for research. And I think last week, either here or in my stockcharts.com show, Trading Simplified, I talked about looking at a daily signal with this just because the signals would catch up a little quicker. Now, the buy signal would be, number one, you have to be above the buy line, okay? It means that you're within 10% of uh, the 50-week closing high, which would be right here. And number two, you'd have to have Landry light, meaning that you'd have you have to have two bars where the lows are greater than the 50-week moving average. So your last buy signal was back here at the end of that week, okay? And then your sell signal obviously was right here. Now I say it's obvious. It's obvious to me because the system on the sell side just says you have to have a close below the 50 week moving average and you have to be below the buy line. That's it. So we get out a little quicker on the short side. We don't sit around and wait for the for the Landry light to happen. On the long side, it takes a little bit longer to trigger. Now the beauty of this system is back when let's say like 2002, 2003, where a market takes a long, 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 long time to bottom. The market does this, goes down, oops, goes down for a long, long time, and then begins to bottom out like this. Then this buy line begins to catch up. And before you know it, you're buying into this market at fairly low levels, which is really, really, really cool. Unfortunately, as we're learning now, when you have these V-shaped recoveries, it doesn't work as well. Now, there are other things that we could watch on a daily basis and even on a weekly basis to help get us in a little bit sooner. But as a general statement, a system like this will be a little close, a little slow to catch up. Now, the other thing I was thinking about is, as we'll see in one second, we talk about the, the death cross and bad things happening below the death cross and bad things happening below the 200-day moving average which I need to see if I remember their names properly. Leo and Gayard, I think, did a paper on how bad things happen below the 200-day moving average. And that's something we talk about quite a bit. In fact, if you just look at the 200-day moving average on this chart here, this is for a pretty bad spill. I mean, we went from, what, 3,000 and change down to 2,800, 800, 900 points in the S&P. That's nothing to sneeze at over several weeks so bad things can happen the other thing that i said recently is bad things happen below the 10 percent line so anytime there's some sort of weakness in the market you have to be careful that there's not going to be more weakness or you have to brace sometimes for more weakness or said alternatively bad things but anyway we could get this buy signal setting up soon which would be kind of cool to watch it unfold now, let's take a look at the weekly bow tie. One thing that's been concerning me, and I'm not going to bore you with the chart this week, but as I've shown many, many, many times, weekly bow ties can be really fantastic for keeping you in bull markets and getting you out of bull markets when they become bear markets, rinse and repeat, go back throughout history. I know it works really well over the last 30, 40 years. I haven't gone back to the 1900s, but I'd be willing to bet. 100 bucks that it's probably worked fairly well throughout history. Now, the question is, have we avoided a sell signal? Now, last week we talked about the pullback after we had the bow tie to the downside. Bow tie meaning that the 10 simple crossed below the 20 exponential and 30 exponential and the 20 exponential crossed below the 30 exponential. And that suggests that the market has topped and the trend has turned. But so far, we really didn't have a trigger, at least if you're using a conservative trigger on that signal. And like I said last week, 
anything above the moving averages, Tarzan speak, good. And anything below the moving averages, Tarzan speak, bad, especially if it goes down and triggers that longer term signal. So we're not out of the woods yet, but boy, I tell you, it's looking better and better. I am long a few stocks, I'm long an IPO. We'll talk about that in one second. Good to see that speculation coming back to areas like IPOs. And we have had some spills here and there in some of these momentum stocks, but hopefully, and I know you said hope, but hopefully that's just a pullback and we don't end up like this Tarzan on the downside. Now, I just wanted to zoom in real quick just to show you, as I've said quite a bit, and I learned this from Greg Morris, when the price crosses above the exponential moving average, and it could be any exponential moving average, a five-day, a three-day, a 100-day, a 500-day, the exponential moving average will turn up. So you can see that we have a close above the 20-day exponential moving average. And the moving average has turned up, as has the 30-day exponential moving average. Now, you'll also notice that the 10 simple moving average, and I'm saying 30-day, These are this is a weekly chart, so it'd be 30-week. I should always just use the word period. But you can see that the 10 has caught up fairly quickly because we're dropping off these low prices over here, and then we're adding in these higher prices over here. So the point I'm trying to make is as long as we stay above, let's say 29.50 or so, these moving averages will continue to come together and begin to cross over to the upside. Now also obviously point up as they do. This is the 200 day moving average I have plotted as at the as the orange line, which is just above the trading range that we were in and you can see that we've broken up above the 200 day moving average which is also again just above that trading range i used to joke i was lucky early i, was, I actually woke up thinking about how lucky i was early in my career and then i got to thinking about it as well a lot of that luck i made right it's kind of like this the snoop doggy dog for all the hard work i'd like to thank me snoop doggy dog did a little speech which was funny as heck google it if you get a chance or do a youtube on it, you know, for my success, I would like to thank me for getting up every early every day and working hard. I'd like to thank me, but I was really lucky. I, I did an article in 1995 or 96. It escapes me at the moment. Anyway, it was for Stocks and Commodities magazine, and that launched my entire career. I ended up with two different hedge funds and maybe a third one for a period of time. One was for 14 years. I ended up becoming a commodity trading advisor and I held that designation I think for 14 years and a lot of other things have happened through that and one of the things was that I became a part of a website for traders one of the first ones out there it was trading markets and then it was market watch I believe which is CBS and trading markets is kind of it's kind of died out since then, but back in the day, it was it was pretty cool. We used to call it Trade Hard back then, but they decided to soften the name, no pun intended. But anyway, that allowed me the writing of the article and becoming part of trading markets and a few other things that were kind of all ancillary helped me to hook up with some seasoned traders and i learned a lot from him in the process and one of the the gentlemen uh, he and i became really close and we were talking about how a lot of technicals come together well lo and behold the 200 day moving average is where right at the top of the range and there's an old cajun joke about the thermos keeping the hot things hot and the cold things cold how do it no and that's one of the things we would always joke about when we'd see some technicals come together at the same point such as a major moving average and the top of a trading range. By the way, this obviously was a death cross back here, or as I call it, the death cross. And as I've said quite a bit, you don't necessarily want to trade the signal in and of itself because it's a very, very small edge, if any at all, trading those death crosses and golden crosses. But bad things do happen below the 
death cross, okay? Just like bad things happen below the 10% line, okay? And any other technical indicator you want to use when the market has weakened. But you can see that the 50-day is turning back up because we're what? Dropping off those low prices, adding in high prices. So it's going to catch up the price fairly quickly. It's also going to start catching up that 200-day moving average fairly quickly. But I guess you could argue as far as bad things happening below the death cross crossing is that it ain't over yet. I'm waiting on a limit order to get hit. That's why I'm some lagging here. One of the random thoughts I've been having lately, and this is left up from last week, but it's even more true this week, is will the old leaders become the new laggards? And that happens a lot of times when a market shifts from a bear market phase to a bull market phase. Your leaders that are that bring you out of the bear market or the down market, whatever you want to call it, if you don't want to put a label on it, the leaders that do that often become a source of funds. Let's say fund managers piled into these momentum stocks. They've got really, really good profits. And all of a sudden, they start seeing some of these stocks at low levels begin to rally. Or in general, the fund managers, they might not be good market timers or good traders. They might just buy stocks that are low. And they sell. They might just size, sell stocks that are high. So that happens sometimes. It can be a little perverse because I preach momentum, momentum, momentum. And sometimes the momentum begins to erode, or as I often say, it ends badly sometimes. Well, it always ends badly eventually. And then new stocks emerge. So what I did here, which was kind of kind of a cool feature with TC, I like to play with every now and then. I thought it'd be cool to measure from the bottom of the range to where we are as of about an hour ago and you can see the market has rallied almost seven percent in that time pretty impressive rally so when you do this relative strength sort anything above the s p 500 is has been stronger than the s p 500 at least over that period of time and anything below the s p 500 has weakened. Now it's kind of fascinating. What's been strong? Well, gold's been pretty strong. Well, gold's the worst performer down here, as you can see. What else has been strong? Drugs. Drugs have been extremely strong. Okay. Well, drugs weak on a relative basis. Okay. Biotech, another one of those strong areas. Retail, super strong. We'll look at all these when we get to the live charts. But you can see all these ones down here are laggards, and then all the ones up here are doing fairly well. Well, what's been one of the worst areas out there? The banks. Well, banks are up 15% since last week. What else is bad? Well, leisure. Nobody's going to do anything right now, okay? So leisure it has begun to rally. So I don't want to read too much in this, but in some cases, this is a sign of hope. Energies, look at that, up 11%. I'm long AR in the energies. This was stocked from the Landry list about a week ago. And I'm also long MR. MR was an official recommendation. So I'm now long two energy stocks. Why? Well, energy stocks are starting to bottom out and go up. I'm not bottom fishing. I'm waiting for something like a bow tie to occur and looking to get long. So I wouldn't read too, too much into this. But again, the momentum is weakening and the value is increasing. And I'm trying to think of his name. He gave a fantastic presentation at last october's i was speaking at the tsaaf conference last october and a gentleman from dorsey wright which is now part of nasdaq gave a fantastic speech to talk about how value stocks can become momentum and i think that's sort of the phase that we could be entering into it's not going to necessarily happen overnight but i think we need to keep our eyes wide open so i have been over the years, you see me talk about, okay, guys, I like this Phoenix setup, meaning that this energy stock has bottomed out for years, or these energies have bottomed out for years, and now they're beginning to bow tie. And without knowing it, I was trading the value stocks that are becoming momentum stocks. And he did have an interesting thing he pointed out. He said, if you never wanted to make any money in the markets, put half your money in a value portfolio and half your money in a momentum portfolio because those two are often opposite, at least longer term. So in other words, 
when value is rallying, rallying, momentum begins to die out. And when momentum is dying out, value is rallying. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And I'll get his name for next week, or I'll make sure I'll put it in the edited version. Now, as far as leaders becoming laggards, based on yesterday's intraday action in Zoom, I thought it might have topped out as of yesterday, but then I also thought to myself, self, do not pick a top until you have a signal like a bow tie or something else. But I still think that Zoom is in the process of bottoming. We showed it last week. It still has this big picture, head and shoulders top to it. So far, it's gradually beginning to roll over, but it's taking its own sweet time. Now, one thing I'm, I was talking about privately with one of you guys is that the longer a top takes to make the more important that top is and i think that's i think the last of the mohicans are beginning to come in I, I haven't really done a study on this but i think it'd be kind of interesting to notice the share size coming into the market on something like this and it's like lately let's say i'm playing like an open gap reversal like this morning for instance arna it's like I'm getting filled on like 10 shares and then 100 shares and another 100 shares and another 50 shares and 25 shares. I'm getting these little tiny fills. So I'm wondering if the public is the last to give in or give up on these momentum stocks. And if the institutions or as Linda Rasky used to say, feeding the ducks while they're quacking. So kind of an interesting thing, maybe some fodder for research there. I wouldn't read too much into it, but it is kind of interesting that when I go to, to study what happened during the day, do a little forensics or a little post-mortem, it's like usually, I used to have to just have one or two trades to, for my fill. And now I'm looking at all of these little odd lots that are filling out. So I don't know if that's, I'm just thinking out loud. I don't know if that's something that can be telling or not, but at the least, you could say that this stock has lost momentum because where was it back in March at its highs? About 170. Where is it now? Yeah, about 170. So now we've got April, May. We've got two months where the stock has not made any forward progress. So it looks like it's slowly beginning to die out. And Zoom is like the poster child, as you probably know, for this whole pandemic thing. So it'll be interesting to see what's going to happen there. Now, I guess mRNA would be another one of those poster childs or children because they had the vaccine or the work on the vaccine. And then you could see that it has begun to implode quite a bit, going from up around 90 down to the mid 40. So it almost half, but it's had quite an impressive run. So one would expect some corrective action, but yesterday, obviously we had the big gap down and so far we've had the bounce back. Now, one thing I was thinking about this morning is Larry Connors years ago wrote about big picture news reversals. And I suppose on a smaller picture, and I went in and tried to play this ogre yesterday and overall I lost money on the trade. I got in a little too early and then I got in again, which mitigated some of the damage, but overall I actually lost money. So look at that, a, a trader actually, a guru actually admitting that he lost money as opposed to, hey, look at my backpack full of $60,000 that I made today, which is stupid. I'm gonna have more to say about that in an upcoming uh, <laughs> trading simplified show. So keep, keep an eye out for that. Anyway, long story endless. Larry Connor's point was that if you have a stock that has bad news, my occasion just slipped out, I said bad, you look at the close of the day before the bad news, and when that close gets taken out to the upside, you buy the stock, okay? And that's just what he calls a big picture news reversal. So your buy line would be here following, if you're following that, okay? And the example that I often use is I was in Dallas speaking several years back, or might have been almost 10 years now, Geez, I'm getting old fast. It comes at you fast, right? Anyway, somebody said, uh, what's going to happen now? You know, everybody's always wants to ask about it, talk about Apple. I'd rather talk about an mRNA or, or ZM or ARNA 
something like that, which I got long ARNA this morning. We talked about that one in the Facebook group. Some slightly more obscure stock than Apple. Anyway, but everybody wants to talk about it, so I'm forced to talk about it. And they're like, Dave, what's going to happen when Mr. when Mr. Steve Jobs dies? And I said, well, look at the stock the day before he dies and then buy the stock when that close gets taken out. And that's the that's the whole idea behind Connor's big picture news reversal. Now, I wouldn't rush out and trade these news reversals in and of themselves unless it's something that you want to really focus on. But if you've got a strong ass stock like this that pulls back, it might be something that you consider doing, at least because you're stacking the odds in your favor, because you've got the momentum behind you, you've got the pullback behind you, and then you've got the thrust back up to the news reversal. Now, not to think too much, but will this, if, if this stock pops back to old highs, is that going to just be the retail pushing it higher while the institution feeds it to you? I don't know, but it'd be kind of an interesting thing to think about it, at least academic. Now, some random thoughts. I've been saying quite a bit that volatility is whack. I cut out the 50-day historical volatility from the Landry list, and I wish I'd have highlighted the ones that we're looking at today, but I guarantee you, I think they're all triple digits. And it's just crazy. I've never recommended a stock with an HV other than one little uranium stock, UNM, if memory serves, and it might have been, and I'm going to try to say the word, molybdium stock. It might have been a molybdium. It was a while back, a few years back, a few years back, 15 years ago. <laughs> Last week, no, 15 years ago, the rare earth stocks were really hot. And I remember saying to my peeps, it's like, okay, I like this little uranium stock, but this uh, HV at 150 is just absolutely whack. Well, now the HV of at least 100 seems to be normal. And I've recommended quite a few stocks lately with the HVs in the 150 or so range. Now, keep in mind, like I said last week, I showed a high HV stock that imploded overnight. It can happen, okay? And that's why we're trading fewer and fewer shares. Even though volatility is crazy, like I just said, we are going after these highly volatile stocks, but we are respecting the risk by trading fewer shares. Well, they require a wider stop, so we were, we're trading fewer shares because of the wider stop. Speaking of stops, money management, money management, and money management is crucial. There's my random thoughts. Now, I want to talk a little bit about pioneer patterns and IPOs. And it's kind of interesting. Like the American pioneers, you're either going to get the gold or you're going to get arrows in your back. And then I think we have an example of both here. So when you're looking at IPOs, I won't buy an IPO until the close of the fifth day at the earliest. So that's day one, day two, day three day four and day five. Now, it just so happens in this particular case, on day five, it's a new closing high. Now, there's a lot of caveats to this little setup, so don't rush out and trade it. But if you are looking to trade it and you're in the Facebook group, feel free to bring up stocks that you think fit it, and I'll be happy to discuss them with you, as will, I'm sure, my other members there. This was one we talked about in Facebook. It was a new closing high. That's one of the rules of the buy it B. And then the other is it also has to be greater than day one. Hang on a second. I just got to fill. All right. Free rolling. Thank you, baby Jesus. ARNA has hit the initial profit target for those who are playing along at home. Nice little breakout in the um, SPXL. I wanted to catch that. <laughs> oh, well. I guess you can't kiss all the women. Yeah, if time allows, I'll, I'll walk you through that ARNA trade. Yeah, I, I just banged out the IPT and ARNA. That was an alert you just heard. I also wanted to get long SPXL, but I was too busy talking to you guys. <laughs> so anyway, day five, new closing high. That's a buy because you're also above the day one high, okay? Now, you don't have to worry about the day one high if any of the other highs takes it out. I guess that's that's a, I'm saying the same thing. But if the day one high is up here somewhere, 
it also has to close above that high, okay, a day one high. Now, it does not have to close above this high here because we're only worried about the day one high, okay? And you can see that that's been exceeded on days two, days three, and that's it. And then on this day, we close at a new closing high. So it was a buy. I hate to stop to make a trade. Let's see, 41. I'll lay them on. Hang on, I gotta make some. I can do something. Stay with me. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, we'll talk about that ARNA in a second, and I'll walk you through it. So in a case like this, you got a five-day closing high. So you would buy market on close. Now, as I've said before, it is kind of a leap of faith, especially in this particular case. Was it a weekend? No, this wasn't a weekend. But sometimes you're buying into a weekend, and that could be a little stressful. A lot of IPOs come public on Mondays. And then what happened? Well, within three days, I was stopped out. So I dropped an F-bomb. Actually, I dropped another F-bomb. And then another F-bomb. And of course, by the end of the day, it turned around and went positive by a lot on the day. I've had some, I had some clients that were lucky. Like, oh, I missed the order. <laughs> it's like, well, you know, longer term, you want to honor that stop. But yeah, you got lucky. So dropped a bunch of F-bombs on that one. And then I was thinking back to the well, and this is the hard trade to make. And I was looking at the Facebook group earlier today, and I was looking through the uh, it's Dave Landry's Trend Traders is the name of the group. And I should take my name out of the title because you guys do all the heavy lifting there. And I follow you guys probably a lot more than you follow me, which is pretty awesome. I should call it uh, Trend Traders United or something. But anyway, so as they get back to the well, and I know some of you guys were talking about, man, it's going to be hard to go back to this one. We just lost money in it. But I think you have to see a position as a standalone position in something new in and of itself. So as they get back to the well, and if it doesn't work, it's back to the S hole, right? <laughs> anyway, so here is the next setup. And what I was thinking, somebody asked me, okay, Dave, can, should we take a secondary setup here, a secondary pioneer setup? So let's say you took the first setup on that new closing high and it failed miserable. Should you take the next closing high? And my thinking was, well, why not have a little bit of momentum too, okay? Why not wait for a little bit of momentum? And I have this little five-day SMA setup and... What I'm looking for there is Landry Light, okay, and a new closing high. So we've got two things working for us, a new closing high, which means the stock is performing well, and Landry Light bases the five-day SMA. So the low is greater than the five-day SMA, meaning that you've got a little momentum to the upside, and you have a new closing high. And I've, I've somebody, had given me a name for this and I've forgotten it. So, but we need to do like the IPO Go system, or I guess I got to put my name on it. Otherwise, my wife will get mad at me. She's been asking me to name something forever. That's how we came up with Landry Light based on one of you guys' suggestions because you used to just call it Daylight and then it was Dave Light. So, anyway, close at new closing high, low below the moving average. So, that was a buy signal on that one. And we should be into a profit zone pretty soon on that. Now, as you heard me mention quite a few times, I do have a Facebook group, but you have to be a gold member of DaveLandry.com. And I'd be willing to bet if you ask people in the group, they would tell you that it is worth it. And the reason you have to be a gold member is to keep the riffraff out. I want to make sure everybody, I'm half kidding. I want to make sure everybody is a trend trader and adhere somewhat to the methodology. We all have our little tweaks and different ways of doing things, and we do things outside of the methodology. Me too, okay? Nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's how we learn. But as a general statement, I want to keep us focused on the methodology. The great thing there is you can interact with other traders, and you can ask for help. And a lot of times, people will ask me a question, and by the time I get around to answering it, three or four of you guys have answered it, and for that, I thank you. And I've learned a lot from you guys in the process, too. So, again, I think it's really more your group than it is mine. My wife told me recently, that's the best thing you've ever done. 
I love the group. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate that. Yeah, I actually used, uh, I actually cut your post on that and actually put it on the website. So thank you on that. And you'll see signs and signals. And I'll point things out. Like this morning, I pointed out the opening gap reversal and ARNA. Not that they always work that great, but you know, every now and then we get a really good one. And I'll point it out. And you guys have pointed out some really good things too, especially like IPOs and all. I've picked up some great IPOs from you. And uh, you know, Jim's saying he loves this group. Jim does market timing for the group. He's head of market timing. That's his unofficial title. And he does a lot of shorter term research, 30 minute, 60 minute type of charts. And I really enjoy what he's doing there. So thank you, Jim. Appreciate that. If you can follow along with trades like this morning's Ogres, over to get reversal, and the $4 million challenge, which hasn't worked so well as of late, but we're going to work on that. So you can go to this URL here, www.davelander.com, become dash a dash better dash trader dash w dash these dash three dash things. And three is spelled out in case you listen to the podcast or just davelander.com slash members. All right, let me just shift gears and move over to the live charts. No, Elizabeth, I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up. Uh, Elizabeth's asked, do you have my email? I should have added here. Yeah, go ahead and add it, add it here. Um, this morning was just crazy. Yeah, but I appreciate you getting, getting them to me ahead of time. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get them. Thank you. Sorry about that. I'm so glad you brought it up too, because I, was, I meant to say that earlier in the presentation. All right, I want to take a look at the markets first. And then once we do that, we'll start talking about your individual stock picks. So keep those keep those coming. And then, you know what? Let me walk you through the ARNA trade real quick. So I run a scan every morning and we talk about this in the Facebook group. So I'm not going to bore you with that. But the scan said that this stock was going to gap lower. And when I pulled the chart, this is what it looked like. Now, it's not the best looking setup in the world, but it has broken out the brand new highs. It has nearly doubled over a short period of time. In an ideal world, this is what I want to do. Or this is the, the opening gap reversals that I want to trade. And by the way, I explained them last week or week before, so you can look at that on Facebook. I'm sorry, on YouTube. But if you go in the members area, I have spent hours and hours talking about opening gap reversals. My favorite ones are when you have a nice little pullback and then you have a gap down like this and this trend goes way, 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 way back. You got a serious, serious trend. Then you have this gap down and that shades out some nervous Nellies, but institutions might decide to come in or reach out. It doesn't matter who, but all of a sudden it could become a bit of a bargain. If you're thinking along the lines of a market maker, and there's some bad news that comes out, the market maker has to buy that stock from you by law. So what he does is he opens it as low as possible, knowing that he could bring it back up, okay? Probably worked a little bit better when you actually had specialists on the floor and all, but it still, as a general statement, works pretty good. Doesn't always work, obviously. So what you could do is, if you're watching an intraday chart, and I'll show you my trades here in just one second, and it opens up, you could say, okay, well, it breaks out of that opening range. I'm gonna take that trade. And then I'm gonna put a stop down here. I have initial profit target up here. And then whatever the distance is from here, which I calculate this to my low, I'm gonna go ahead and trail this stop up intraday. Now in this particular case, Let's say you're going to put on 200 shares. Let's keep the math easy. So let's say you buy 200 here. So I have 100 on a trailing stop and 100 at a limit order on the IPT, okay? And if this stock rallies up and hits the IPT, half of those shares are sold, 100 shares. And then this trailing stop is at break even. And now there's nothing to do. I call that the gym trade. Back when the gym was still open, don't laugh. I used to go to the gym, believe it or not. I actually enjoy going to the gym. And I call it the gym trade because there's nothing to do other than come home at the end of the day, or by the end of the day, I should say, and exit the trade. So let's just take a look at this one today. So we come in today and we see that it gaps down on the open. Gaps down to here, 
Now this gap has to be fairly sizable. You got to want you want to make sure that some people got knocked out of the market, likely a bit of a panic in the market. Remember, with technical analysis, what are we doing? We're reading the psychology of the market, and at the same time, we're embracing our own, and that's the best definition that I have come up with. I came up with my own definition for that. I'm sure somebody else has probably said something very similar. So when you see that big gap down, you know that there's a chance, and a chance being a key word, this is all a chance, by the way, that it's going to rally higher. And if it doesn't, it's kind of like the old Will Rogers thing. Don't buy it. Don't buy, you buy stocks that go up. They don't go up. Don't buy them. Now, obviously, he was being tongue in cheek, but there's a lot of truth to that. In fact, that's kind of a, my whole system, pretty much, for buying IPOs. So you come in here, and let's let's just do a little walkthrough here. And let me give you my exact entry so you'll know. Hang on, let me go to let me go to my quote screen. So I got a little skittage on the fill, but I said, okay, if this thing rallies up, I think I had it at 50. I have to I, got, I don't want to bore you and go try to find the order, but I figured that okay. If this thing can rally up, let's say to 53 and a half. Now, one thing it helps to do is take a look at the daily chart, okay? Because the daily chart is going to give you some perspective, okay? So if you're looking at the daily chart and you're thinking, okay, well, it's gapped down here. Let me just back it out one day, see if I'm going to show you. Sometimes when you look at a daily chart, and let's say it gaps like right around here, I think is where it gapped. If you look at a daily chart, you'll put your entry a little bit higher because if you look at that intraday chart, each little bar looks like a huge move. And this might only be a blip on the daily. So I like to keep the daily chart up here on my screen to give me perspective. And then I look at the five minute chart down here to figure out where I'm going to get in. And if this this doesn't seem close in a five minute, but if I look at the daily chart, I'm like, oh, wait a minute, let me give it a little bit of wiggle room. Maybe you want to get in like right here. Because a lot of times they'll rally up and come back in. Now, lesson learned, again, yesterday, I my first trade at least failed miserably on the ARNA. All right, let's get back to a five minute chart. I think I already forgot my order. <laughs> Anyway, so you come in and the stock gaps lower. Now, I was lucky in this case. It's great when they gap lower and then immediately go lower. That makes your entry a little easier. So I was like, okay, well, let me give it some wiggle room. So I had it right in here, probably about 53.50 if memory serves. And I was looking for two points. So two points to the upside. Okay. And then a two point trailing stop because if you look at here, it's like 53 and change. Down here is like 51 or whatever below the low. This is two points. Okay, so this is a trailing stop. And then up here, 55, 50, I think is where it was, where it just hit somewhere in here. That was my initial profit target. So again, let's keep the math easy 200 shares here, minus 100 on a trailing stop, minus 100 on the IPT. Okay, so as this stock rallies, this trailing stock comes higher. And now, once it goes two points, you're at break even. So trailing stop is up here somewhere. So if it gets stopped out on the remainder, so what? Okay, but that's the idea to catch that pop back in the direction of the trend. Trust me, they don't always work this well. The other thing I was thinking about this morning when I woke up is. If you could wait and wait and wait and wait and wait, it'd be super, super, super duper patient with these opening gap reversals. They will happen. And you might have to wait weeks for them, but it's worth the wait, okay? And that's what it looks like on a daily gap lower and then nice little rally higher. It might be easy to see them on these. They got these funny looking charts. He was funny looking. Let me show you these funny looking charts I just discovered. These funny little charts where you could see the open and the close, and it's a little bit more, you could see the open and the close a little bit easier. 
So you see the open there, and then right here is where we are now on the day. So sometimes they show up a little better in those funny looking charts. He was funny looking. <laughs> I love Fargo. My wife hates the movie. I think I think there's two types of people in the world: those who like Fargo and those who don't. All right, S&P 500. So far, so good. Knock on wood. Okay. We've broken out of this trading range. We're up above 3,000. Gives us a nice round inflection point. Looking pretty good. I'm still concerned, obviously, about a big picture retrace rally, meaning that rallies up, stalls out, rolls back over. But so far, so good. So let's just see what happens there. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. It was kind of interesting a few days ago when we had a pretty decent day of the P's and then the NASDAQ was coming back in. That was kind of a shot across the bow or a warning shot, whatever you want to call it, basically saying that, hey, tech stocks could be running out of steam in here. And maybe these value stocks are doing a little bit better with the S&P outperforming the NASDAQ. But you come in with a day like today, NASDAQ is doing pretty darn good. Let's take a look at gold while we're here. Gold's been doing pretty good, but like I said a few minutes ago, it's lost a little steam in here. And I didn't play any gold stocks in this rally because you had this big old V-shaped recovery. And by the time they pulled back, I just didn't see any worth playing. And gold stocks, as you know, can be a little choppy and wild and crazy. Let's take a look at the Rusty. The Rusty's finally got its act in the gear, or gear and act. How, how do you say that? Today, and notwithstanding, a little bit of an opening gap reversal there. Kind of interesting. S&P 500 off to the races. NASDAQ off to the races. Russell 2000. 2000 stalling out a little bit. Okay. Now, it also has a big picture retrace look to it. Meaning that you've it's overbought in this run higher. But you don't routine one day at a time. Now, as I was saying earlier... Some of these laggards in here, such as the energies, let's take a look at like a daily bow tie. Well, not a whole lot to glean there other than they have flipped over to the upside and the 10 is above the 20 and 20 is above the 30. So that's looking a little bit better. So you see energies have been improving. On an individual issue basis, we're long MR. You can see it's had a nice run higher, pullback, and today notwithstanding, beginning to rally out of that pullback. I'm long personally AR, which was also a Landry list stock, not an official recommendation, but nice little cup and handle pullback. And I think it was also a bow tie. Yeah, see, you've got a bow tie down here to the upside after making all time lows, maybe major, major, major lows. Yeah, that's kind of a, I wouldn't call it a Phoenix stock because the Phoenix stock, I like to see them bottom out for a long, long time. But it did hit major, major lows, made a bow tie, and so far, knock on wood, so good. Hope I'm not jinxing these things. So, again, as I've been saying, some of the leaders becoming laggards, some of the laggards becoming leaders. Here's gold, the stocks, as you can see. I wouldn't count them down and out just yet, but they're certainly losing a little steam. As I often say, indicators are what? Not indicators, but illustrators. When I put the bow ties in, what are the bow ties doing? Well, they're turning down. Okay. It's like, well, wait a minute. I'm all bullish on gold. Let me take a measurement here. So over the last, let's say, month or so, they're actually lower. So they've lost some steam in here. I wouldn't count them down and out again just yet, but they certainly are losing some steam. And so far, I really don't have any regrets on not going after some of those gold stocks. Silver looking a little bit better. The problem with silver is it's few big stocks, probably like SSRM, if I had to guess, and uh, WPM, SSRM, is that it? Yeah, that stock ran up, and then I think it was WPM, Wheaton maybe, and the rest of the silver stocks aren't doing really that great or as good as these two for sure. So anyway, conglomerates, another one of those areas has been improving as of late, kind of wide and loose. I wouldn't rush out and trade it. You can see it has worked its way higher. Banks, again, another one of those areas improving or at least basing out. I wouldn't rush out and buy them just yet. But what are the bow ties saying? Well, look at that. You could have a bow tie come together soon. 
I would prefer if this base was six months long or a year long or two years long, but I guess in markets, you got to take what you can get. And we are coming off of, yeah, look at that. We're coming off of major, major lows here. So how exciting is that? Banks. Okay. It's like a million of them. <laughs> it's like, but this could be the new momentum stocks, right? Insurance has been lagging quite a bit. Now it's beginning to bottom out and take off. Okay. So these areas that have been doing poorly are now doing much better. Real estate improving, as you can see. Drugs are hanging in there, though. They were losing a little steam in here, but now they're making new high. So that's certainly a good thing. So maybe we can have momentum and value for a while. Okay. Maybe the energy stocks could rally for a while. I hope they do. I'm along two of them. And then maybe we can have some momentum. Too. What else is happening? Retail. Retail was losing a little steam in here, but now it's banging out new highs again. That's a good thing. Transport's kind of iffy, right? Who in the hell wants to fly anywhere, right? Well, now they're beginning to improve a little bit. And you can see the moving averages are now back in uptrend proper order. Semiconductors have been doing pretty good in here as of late, not too far from all time high, sort of like the NASDAQ itself. My big concern, if I haven't said it just yet, is with these V-shaped recoveries at high levels, by the time the market's all the way up here, it's very, very, very overbought. As I've said often, hard to run a race right after you have ran a race. All right, keep the stock picks coming. We'll talk about them. Okay, Elizabeth, that one's on the Landry list. I guess we could talk about it though. SMG. Technically, it is a TKO in this particular market with a lot of stocks pulling back nicely and sharply in here. I'd almost prefer to find something that's in a deep pullback or a deeper pullback as opposed to something that is a TKO just off of brand new highs. Now, the reason I'm saying this is your entry for the TKO would be up here. And by the time you get all the way back up here, you've given up all that reversion to the mean move. Okay. But it's not a bad looking stock. I think I would just prefer at this juncture to trade something other than this one in a, that's not a TKL right at brand new highs. In other words, I'd like to see, or maybe if it takes out this TKL low, it pulls back a little bit. So you'd have an entry somewhere in here and you'd catch that reversion to the mean back in the direction of the trend. Spot. Spot made my list. I think I, I don't know if it's still on the list or not. It would require a fairly wide stop. But yeah, it looks pretty good. It's broken out from this major, major base in here. It needs to pull back a little bit further, though. So maybe on a pullback to 175. That one's definitely in my momentum list. FVRR. And Elizabeth, the only thing I want to ask you, I don't I don't know if you're on a service yet or not. I think we were talking about that. But your picks are really good. So you're 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 hitting a lot of those landry list stocks. <laughs> so the only thing I would ask you, once you get on a service, is just uh not bring those up. But hey, yeah, this one looks pretty good. It's like I'd like a little bit deeper pullback, but you know, the market really hasn't been giving me the deeper pullback that I like. I'd almost like to see this one pull back to 50. It's at a little bit um higher levels. So yeah, that's right. You're not in a service yet, which is good because I'm impressed. Your uh, stock picks are pretty good in here. Nice momentum, pullbacks. You're uh, you're clicking. Very good. Mine's at 55.75 in the RNA. Let's see if you got it. 55.75. Let's see if you got it. Not quite. No, no, you're 56.41. You got it. All right, congratulations on that, Zach. Good job. See, that's Zach's in the group. All right, pets. Pet, you mean pets? Pets is one I was watching recently because it made this nice deep pullback after a thrust higher, accelerated higher. But now it's kind of like losing steam in here. It almost has that gatekeeper look. Not that I'm excited to rush out and short anything just yet, but it looks like it could be running out of steam in here. So I would almost put that on my possible short list. 
And then Gan missed the entry. Yeah, too late on Gan. You should actually be looking to, I shouldn't say this until I bang out my initial profit target. You should actually be looking to take profits on this one. In fact, that's come off a little bit. I must have jinxed it by uh, talking about it. Yeah, if I'd have gotten in when I should have gotten in, I'd be taking profits this morning on that one. So I need to reevaluate that one. NVIDIA. My only issue here, which looks like I drew it in last week, is that it kind of pulled all the way back to its prior little breakout, but it's pretty good. It's decent. Okay, overall, I'd say I like it. You got a tiny gap in here, but you got to squint your eyes to see it. You got what I call a double top knockout or close to it, where you get a new high, you get a few bars in between, and you get the knockout move. So yeah, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say a high five on that one, Elizabeth. Good eye. Looking forward to having you on the service. Maybe you could run the service for me when uh when I'm that feeling good. <laughs> HL. HL is, I don't like the way it's up here. Let's just take a look at a longer term. I don't like the way it's bumping up against these highs in here. If it was at bottoming out at lower levels and make it a cup and handle, I'd like it a little bit more. But it's okay because uh, it is hitting these highs. But let's draw this line back in time. It does have some overhead supply, some resistance. This is a silver stock, obviously. Had a extended family member held this stock for years, and I remember when it ran from like down here to seven. I called him up; it was up about four hundred percent. He held it for like twenty years. It's like you doing okay? And you hack like, ah, man, that's old. That it's like, oh man, <laughs> held on for twenty years. Just one more year, you made it, right? Anyway, yeah, I would pass on that. Just not that excited about. I think there's so much other momentum out there. I'm not really seeing a whole lot to get excited about, even though silver's doing okay and gold's doing okay. It's not horrible. Maybe a little bit deeper pullback in here. It would be okay, but I think I'm going to pass. And then again, you've got that overhead supply. People who held this for 20 years looking to get out. So I would pass on that one. ASGN. All right. Any more picks? We're slowing down on picks. We're catching up, I should say. Yeah. You know, since the chart is backed out on this one, we can see it doesn't have a tremendous amount of overhead supply, but it is beginning to bump up to against a little. At this juncture, and check back often, um, I would almost prefer some of these stocks that are at higher levels, except for the value stocks, if you want to call them that, or the commodity-related stocks, such as the energies. I prefer those type of stocks at lower levels. And then for the higher level stocks, I would prefer the momentum stocks. There's still biotechs out there looking pretty good. There's some software stocks, hardware stocks, semiconductor stocks, uh, the stocks that you mentioned, Elizabeth, quite a few of those out there that still look pretty good. So I would I would focus mostly on uh, so many stocks to focus on right now. You don't have to go after some of these ones that aren't that are less than perfect, I should say. OK. BRK slash B. I don't know what that is. That Berkshire. You know, people talk, you know, I don't understand why. I hate to go after what's his face. I don't understand why he gets such a he's a sacred cow. It's like, and I brought it up in a professional forum once and nobody would say anything. It's like, <laughs> and he's, don't get me started. He, he's not doing this value thing that you think he is. He's doing a lot of complex deals, uh, derivative things, and he's selling puts. And he's also making deals with companies to where he kind of handicaps the company to make sure he tries to make money. It's, it's just, I don't know. But you can see if the market is going down, so is Berkshire Hathaway, okay? And then what did Berkshire Hathaway lose in this last slide? 30%. There's a few 50% haircuts in Berkshire Hathaway. I've been involved with hedge funds that lose 30 to 50% of their value, and those hedge funds are no more. <laughs> Not that it's funny, you know, because lives are hurt and lives are ruined, but, you know, people just give this guy a pass, even though every now and then he loses half your money. I don't know. And then I read in a book that was like 10 years old that his performance really isn't that fantastic compared to the S&P 500. 
So I don't know if is that the one you wanted me to go on? Didn't mean to go off that rant. So sorry, uh, sorry, Warren. Did I miss you on pets? Yes, you did. So you'll have to watch the recording. I'm trying to watch my son's graduation from Harvard's business. Well, congratulations. Harvard Business School. Wow. Which is the same time, which is right now. Okay. Well, now you might have some money to trade. No wonder why you're looking to uh, buy the trading service. <laughs> good. All right. Chris says, Seal shouldn't have stayed in, but now it looks good to Phoenix. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of caveats here. It is a penny stock. It's got a pretty good volume, though. And I hear you. Um, it will have some resistance along the way. Sort of a bow tie. Yeah, I like it as a super speculative type of play. Maybe a little bit pullback, though. I'd like to see a little pullback. Ideally, I'd like to see a breakout to add or near this peak and then pull back a little bit, a little bit more cup and handle looking. But I hear you. Yeah, I mean, this is going to be, a, this is a volatile stock. I mean, use a, a point and a half stop. <laughs> I'm half kidding. I mean, if you knew they'd never go out of business, that would be a call that never expires, right? Okay. Any more questions? Your favorite Bill Ackerman, Sears, sold Burke at a loss, of course. How do we do it? <laughs> yeah, these uh these hedge fund guys, man, they get you know, human ego never changes. I was watching, and, and I, I said I wasn't gonna bring it up, but I, I clicked on. I don't know if you want to call it clickbait or not. Ironically, I got a shirt on that says clickbait. That's another story. But it was a hedge fund guy that's been like wrong, 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 and and refusing to. And a lot of his arguments were my arguments, right? How are we gonna get through this pandemic, and what are we gonna do? But you know, the stock's going up. Stocks in general going up. So I became a trend following moron on this last leg up. I was pretty bearish on the way down and now I'm getting bullish again, you know? And there was a hedge fund guy and he's still fighting the market like crazy. It's like you, you never, human nature never changes. And, and it's hard to just be a moron, be a trend following moron and go with the flow. Bill Ackerman Sears, he sold Berkshire. Bill Ackman did the, uh, what stock was that debacle? He lost billions in a stock. And he actually probably was up a billion or two because he bought it with the trend, but then he kept adding on the way down. How do he do it? <laughs> Sears and Kmart, huh? BRX, yeah, that was a stock. Uh, what's, it's no longer, uh, did it go away? Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, I've done a few presentations like that. You know, not to be shod on a Friday, but it is a wonderful lesson that, hey, you know what? We all have these big egos and we all try to confuse the issue with facts and we all occasionally do stupid things. And that's why, you know, that was probably the best thing that ever happened to me in my career was being called a trend following moron by somebody that I had unbelievable respect for, somebody that I idolized, you know? It's like, don't meet your heroes, you know? <laughs> Reminds me of, um, y'all remember the, uh, fast, what was that, what was that movie? Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. You ditched Napoleon? He was a dick. <laughs> All right, any more? Why would end pass? Going once, going twice. Well, as usual, I want to thank everybody for attending today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Anything unanswered, if you're in the Facebook group, please bring it up there so we all can chime in. If we don't talk to you now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend and hopefully see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome, Mark.